Hello, everyone, and welcome on into the Betting Pros Podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Viola, and here today to talk to me about one of the most common questions that bettors have. Why can't I parlay this? We're going to be talking correlated parlays, and we're going to be talking a couple betting strategies that you can use to guarantee yourself some profit. So joining me today, none other than Aaron Kessler, a veteran of the bookmaking game. He spent 20 years as the sportsbook director over at the Golden Nugget, and he happens to be a trivia genius. Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. Having an all right day so far. We'll see how it goes. Indeed. Let's see if we can't make it a little bit better. Now, here, of course, we are today talking about some one of the most common questions that a lot of bettors tend to have when they're just starting out, and that is, why can't I parlay these things? And the reason for that most of the time is going to be that those things are what we call correlated. It's, for example, if you have Chiefs minus seven and Chiefs money line, one of the most basic examples I can give you here. You can't parlay those two together because they are what we would call correlated. They relate to each other. If the Chiefs win on the money, if the Chiefs cover the seven, they've obviously won on the money line. Therefore, you can't parlay those two together for better odds, right? Absolutely. And, you know, correlation, as you are going to see it, is not two things that necessarily are the same thing. Where If one hits, the other will hit. It's where one hits, there will be a higher likelihood of it hitting. Now, and one example I always like to give people Say you've got a football team between your high school and the Raiders. Now, the Raiders are favorite. The spread's 55, and the total is 59. You're not going to score in this game, most likely. So if you take the Raiders and you lay the points, that means it's probably going to go over. If you take the points, that means it's probably going to go under because, you know, it's just there are not many scores that are in the middle of that. That's an extreme example, obviously, but you see it with, you know, a football game where it's minus 16 and a total of 41. If you're going over, you're figuring that favorite's going to score a bunch of points. And if they're scoring a bunch of points, they're probably going to cover. So because of that, it's not really a true 2.6 to, to 1 parlay. You know, you're much more likely to hit one or the other. So the books will shut that down. And there are a couple other potential opportunities where something like that happens. It's not just in football. It can be the same thing in something like hockey. If you have a team that you take on the puck line at minus 1.5, you're going to run into the same problem trying to bet the over, right? Right, because the goal totals are so low in hockey, you know, fives and sixes, that if you're laying a puck and a half, you're almost certainly going to go over, or if you're taking it, you're trying to go under there. And, and yeah, it's the reason for that is just more common scores. And, and just because two things are correlated, it means that you can't parlay them together. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use that to your advantage when it comes to making your bets, right? Right, absolutely. You know, in baseball, what a lot of people will do, since the home team doesn't bat in the bottom of the ninth if they're winning, the home team is correlated to the under a bit. You have 17 half innings instead of 18. The away team is correlated to the over. You get 18 half innings for sure if the away team wins. So there are small degrees of correlation you can still use. It's just the direct correlations are going to be locked up by sportsbook. Another one you see a lot is if you're betting matchups, say in NASCAR. You can't bet William Byron over Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin over Chase Elliott, and Martin Truex Jr. over Chase Elliott. Don't want to let you parlay all those because that's just one bet against a guy. You're getting six to one odds on the deal. And one of the big things with that, with that you talk about the things that aren't true odds for a parlay is the fact that you can't parlay prop bets together a lot of the time. And that becomes no more apparent than when it comes time for the Super Bowl, when there are a few things that you can parlay together. But for the most part, on a lot of these props, books aren't going to let you do that, right? Right, because there are so many possible correlations that to set them all up and lock out the correlated events and keep the uncorrelated one op ones open would be pretty much a full-time job. You know, you can't take Van Jefferson over three catches and Van Jefferson over 50 yards. Those are obviously very correlated to each other. But you also have some correlations that might not be as simple. You know, say you're taking, in last year's Super Bowl, you take Odell Beckham Jr. over and Cam Akers under. You're looking at the Rams leaning on the pass game, fewer carries. And because of that, there's a correlation there as well. You can't identify the correlation between everyone in a single game. Now, with the rise of single game parlays, you're seeing a lot of sports books with the black box model. You don't see what goes into it, but they're going to be running things that are going to let you bet these, but the correlation factor 
will take it down a lot. And we don't get a look at that. We don't, you know, you'll see plus 200, plus 200 should be plus 800 normally, but you're not going to get plus 800. You might get plus 600. You might get plus 400. You might get plus 1200, but it's not a very transparent process. Now, that what exactly is it that you mean by the black box model? That's what you're talking about there is it's not math. It's not a oh, specific it's absolutely formula. math. But, but, but there's not a specific formula that you can look at and say these are what the odds are going to be from putting these together. Yeah, there is a specific formula. We just don't have that access as players. And, you know, if you take enough time, I'm sure that there's a way to build it and make a model out of data. But that is an awful lot of work. I know some people have looked at it in the past. I'm not sure that there's enough reward there. Because even so, you're looking at betting parlays that are very long shot events. But yeah, the opportunities out there, if someone wants to dive into that model and try and tear it apart, figure out what the book is using where and find some mistakes, it's open. Now, you talk about potentially finding some mistakes, but if you're just a layman better who's not going to be going out and trying to break down that model, do you recommend staying away from same game parlays? Why is that? I don't recommend betting or staying away from any certain type of bet. You know, there's edges to be found everywhere. And just because you're not someone who has a podcast or has a history of winning a whole bunch of money, it doesn't mean you're not going to find something. Anyone can make a mistake. Anyone can find a mistake. And if you can find the right exploit, you can make some money off of it. So, no, I wouldn't say throw the same game parlays out, but definitely be mindful of the fact that if you think you have an edge on something, it's probably been considered already. And one of the other factors there is that everything that we're talking about here are parlays. You can still tell a story of the game with the bets that you make. That's a common phrase that a lot of people, especially when making fantasy football lineups, like to use in the DFS world. Like you said, an OBJ receiving yards over parlayed with a Cam Akers rushing yards under, you can't make that parlay. But you can still look at it and say, well, I'm going to make these two individual bets because I'm believing this is going to be the game script. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you want to put together a portfolio on a game and try and hit a bunch of things you think are going to happen, then yeah, by all means, if you think the game's going to sh uh, shake up a certain way, definitely play all the things you think are going to happen. But also, you know, make sure you're getting good numbers on each. Make sure that you like each event individually and not just because oh, you know, if this is a shootout and it's a track meet, everyone's going to go over. Because it's not always that easy. They're not always that Rams-Chiefs Monday night game. Want to track all of your wagers in one place? Check out the Betting Pros Pick Tracker at bettingpros.com slash pick tracking. It syncs up with your sports books to tally which picks hit, which miss, and gives you a live look at what the public is doing so you can use real-time tracking to determine which plays to make and which to fade. Get on the leaderboard and quickly become a sharp by using the free advice we offer at bettingpros.com slash pick tracking. But Aaron, you talk about finding the right numbers and finding the right exploits. What are some ways that some sharp bettors are able to look at a board and break down what some of these potential edges that they could have could be? How is it that you find that edge? Well, you know, you look at your percentages of players hitting certain marks and you got to see, you know, convert all the odds to percentages. And if your chance of someone getting a certain milestone is over the one the book's got, then by all means, go for it. But you got to find your midpoints, find your medians, your most common results, and figure out how likely it is that someone's going to go above or below a number. And how is it that you do that when it comes to, uh, you talk about percentages, converting the odds to percentages. What, what does that mean? That's, you know, a real simple process. Say you've got a game at minus 110. So you have to be right more than 11 out of 21 times. You divide 11 by 21, you've got 52.48%. That's how much you need to win to beat 110. So you've got a game at minus 150. You gotta be right three out of five times, 60%. So minus 150 is converted to percentage and you've gotta have a 60% chance of hitting that bet for it to be good. On the other side, so you've got plus 300. You break even points one out of four, so you need a one out of four chance, 25%. And I would definitely recommend all bettors make a chart of all the common percentages until it just becomes second nature. Or keep the chart around. There's no shame in that. And you talk about building this chart. Is this something that you just build yourself by hand? Are you looking at, for example, let's say that it is, uh, it is Connor McDavid to score a goal. 
in a game? Is it that you're looking over his last X amount of games and saying he scored this amount of times? This is the percentage at which he scores. Let's compare that to his odd to score odds to score tonight. How does the percentage match up? Well, you can do that. You can also adjust based on the quality of opponents. You can adjust based off what's been happening his last five games, 10 games, 20 games. Is he taking more shots than usual? Is he taking less shots than usual? Are his line mates the same? You know, anyone can look at the past statistics and say he scores in 40% of his games. He should be plus 150. What, you know, the hard part is, is projecting out what's changed and what the odds should be going forward. And so when you're projecting those odds out and talking about that, how much of that is science and how much of that is personal belief of a bookmaker? Not so much personal belief, but definitely looking at trends and other comparisons. And sometimes there are just events where you're putting up props, but no one really knows what's going to happen. You know, the Broncos Kendall Hinton game was a great example of that. They started a wide receiver at quarterback guy, never played quarterback in the NFL. They didn't have anyone on the roster who was able to play quarterback. And a lot of people were just guessing at that. No one knew what to make it. Is he going to throw for 30 yards? Is he going to throw for 230 yards because they're down? It's one of those things where there weren't any priors and you couldn't tell. So if your model was better than what the books had, you were going to clean up on that. And when you talk about models here, one thing that I want to get into specifically was a great success that you had behind the counter several years back when the Broncos played the Panthers in the Super Bowl. You had the numbers for Peyton Manning stats drastically under what most of the books around Las Vegas had. And sure enough, you ended up being the one who was right on that front. What is it that the models told you? How is it that you came to your conclusion? Well, I've got a little bit of a black box myself that I use for making single game props. So I plugged a few things in. I adjusted for Peyton since he had returned from his injury, how he'd been reacting since that. And I adjusted for how I thought he was going to do going forward against the Panthers defense and his stats that season as well. But the downswing after he'd come back was so low, and it wasn't that he wasn't playing well, which he wasn't, but it was more that he wasn't being used, and he wasn't throwing a ton of passes. I remember the market number on that game for Manning Yards was like 230. And I ran my calculations three times. I had him at like 189. It was a ridiculously low number. I knew it wasn't the right number I was going to put up. So I went to go talk to my boss, Tony, I said, Tony, I'm way off on Peyton Manning. I run everything else. Everything else makes sense. My Manning number is through the floor. You know, we can get in line with everyone else, or we can stick our necks out a little bit. He said, how sure are you? I said, ran the numbers three times. It is what it is. I would definitely want to be on the low side of this. And go do it. So we hung passing yards like 10 yards below everyone else. I adjusted the touchdown props down like 50 cents on every number. And... Basically, on Super Bowl Sunday, if Manning threw a bunch of touchdowns and threw for a bunch of yards against the Panthers, we were not going to be having a good time. As it stands, he threw for 140 yards and two picks. It was a good game. I enjoyed it. A lot of people might not have, but that was definitely a crowning moment for you. Now, when you talk about these models, though, what are some of the dangers of betting based on models, especially if you don't really know what you're looking at and all of a sudden you're betting on a bad model and it's killing you? Well, first off, you got to remember garbage in, garbage out. And another thing is the books are using their own models. And the bettors who are experienced in betting enough money to move the market are using their own models. So say you've got, you know, the Vikings at the Jaguars and you've got Vikings minus six. If the game opens seven and you want to take the Jaguars, but then you see it's moving to seven and a half, it doesn't mean you're wrong necessarily. But it means that someone who knows something is betting on the Vikings. And you should at least step back and consider, is there something I'm missing? You know, why does their model say one thing and mine says another? And now, real quick here, just to get this caveat in, when you say someone knows something, you are, of course, referring to someone who simply may have a better model than you, not something of subterfuge. Yeah, no, this is, you know, sharp bettors who have been doing this for years, who have been very successful in making a lot of money. They're doing it with models. They're not saying, oh, I like the Vikings. I think their rush game is going to be really good this week. 
you know, they're just printing out numbers and getting scores and it is what it is. Exactly. They're using the same techniques that the sports book sports books are using. Right. If, if a better was starting out and wanted to figure out a way to get into using those kind of techniques, what's the best place that they can start? I wouldn't even know where to begin, but you know, just start getting some power ratings, working from there, seeing if there are any adjustments you want to make each week. And before you bet off of them, compare your power rankings to something like, do I think this team is really this much better than this team? Sample your power ratings. If you have the Giants in 89 and you have the Chiefs at 97, think to yourself, would I make the Chiefs eight over the Giants in a neutral? And if not, maybe either your perception is not where it needs to be or your power ranking needs some adjusting. Guys, real quick, remember when you're looking for free picks and sports betting advice, bettingpros.com has you covered with tips from over 150 experts to make it easy for you to cash out. Download the app to get sports betting alerts. You'll get notified of favorable bets based on line movements, consensus picks from the most accurate experts, and vetted systems in play. Betting Pros monitors all of the major sports books, most accurate experts, and top systems to identify the best betting opportunities. So download today in the Apple or Google Play stores. Now, I want to shift gears with you here and talk about a couple other betting strategies that aren't about... I think the Vikings rush game is going to succeed this week. They're about the numbers. They are about strictly trying to lock in profits. And one of those is trying to create a middle. Uh, of course, for those who don't know, a middle is when you attempt to take both sides of a game at specific numbers so that you create an opportunity in the middle where both bets can hit. For example, taking Chiefs plus seven with the Vikings plus one if you can get something that's obviously a smaller middle but if you can get something where you have a chance for both bets to hit that would be a huge middle i'd love to get that one yeah but yeah i mean you can do middling in two ways you can do it planned where it's you know two books at the same time one's got plus four and a half one's got minus three and a half and shoot for the four that one and, and, and to be clear that's that's what's some somewhat known as arbitrage betting yeah and yeah, that's a grinded out play. You're going to lose most of the time, but when you win, you're going to make a lot of money. You're going to hit at minus 110 at 20 to one shot. So yeah, that's absolutely a good way to do things. It doesn't always present itself in that big a form. And you have to think about it. What are your chances of hitting? Are you going to hit this more than one in 20 times? You know, there'll be opportunities on basketball games where you've got a minus 15 and a half and a plus 16 and a half in college. But I mean, are you going to hit that one time out of 20? Maybe. It's just a question of, is it worth it? You know, totals, you might get a middle of a point or two points. Another thing to look at is middling over time instead of middling across books. You know, you may think that a game is going to move and say you think it's at six and it's going to close seven and a half. You lay the six. And if it comes back to seven and a half, you buy back for either the same amount or part of the amount of your bet if you like the minus six. So you can do things like that. You can middle futures, which is bet a long shot. And then if they start to get favored, then bet the other teams and lock in a profit. And what are some of the sports that are really a potential opportunity? What sports give you a bigger chance to create a middle? Where does that opportunity most present itself? College basketball, especially early in the season, you see totals move, you know, five, six points quite often. So you'll see some things there where you can get some middles. I don't recommend using in-game betting to middle because if that line has moved, you're dealing with a new set of circumstances. You know, say you bet a college basketball game over 147 and there's 85 points at the half. Your new number might be 160, but if you bet under that, you're pretty much already locked in on the first bet. There's no reason to start throwing away your profit on a number that's new and rebalanced and probably the correct number for it is. Guys, real quick, I want to talk to you about Sleeper. It's the fastest growing fantasy platform today with millions of players. You probably already have a fantasy league on there. I use it for mine. It's a game-changing product unlike anything else in the industry, and now you could win on Sleeper by playing their new over-under game. It's super simple. First, just choose any sport, then choose two or more players that you like and pick the over-under. For example, number of points in a basketball game or hits in a baseball game. 
Then choose the amount of money you want to enter into the contest. If you pick correctly, you can win anywhere from two times to over 20 times the money that you put in. The main reason I'm excited about Over Under on Sleeper is that it's the only app where I can join my buddies' contests and play together. It's got a built-in group chat where I can see and copy my friends' picks with a tap of a button. It's insanely fun to ride it out and talk some trash together. So stop what you're doing and download Sleeper now to play their new Over Under game. Have fun with your friends and make some money. Just make sure to use promo code BETTINGPROS, all one word, and Sleeper will match your deposit up to $100. Again, download Sleeper and then use promo code BETTINGPROS, all one word, when you deposit and make your first pick. Might I suggest Clay Thompson under 20 and a half points in their matchup with the Memphis Grizzlies on Wednesday. Terms and conditions apply. See sleeper.com for details. And so that's a really interesting point that you make about uh, middling in-game numbers because I was about to suggest, especially in a sport like basketball where you have a wild swings in the action, it's a game of runs, and the numbers can vacillate very wildly. In-game betting, not actually a great way to try and create a middle, right? No, it's really not. You're throwing away a likely profit and putting it on a 50-50 shot. You know, these things are calibrated as they go. You're making two completely different bets. While it may be on the same market, it's, you know, two bets of two different sets of information. Exactly. It's it's two different, uh, as you said, sets of information, because now you're betting on a new number with a new set of information that the book also has. And so their number is just more likely to be accurate now than it was pre-flop. Yeah, I think so. And speaking strictly for myself, I'm much more likely to bet on the same side in game as I would pre-game. Because if the circumstances have changed and I think that... You know, my team had a bad run early. I'm more likely to just press it. I uh, usually don't think that it means, hey, they're down. This team sucks. They're dead. And the other thing is that you're also throwing away a bit of your – you're throwing away your price. You're taking a team that you could have gotten as a dog pre-flop, and now they're going to be a favorite because they've been on a run. I I am very with you there. I One of my favorite strategies for in-game betting in basketball is, like you said, I have a team that I like pre-flop. I might not like their number pre-flop, but I wait for in-game because especially, especially in the NBA, you can see a team go down by 15 points, and that by no means means they're dead. And as long as you like the team and think, okay, well, they can come back, like it's almost a God-given thing that the Warriors are going to go off in the third quarter. So if they're down big in the first, I like to consider going, okay, well, I can get a great number on this team right now and there's still so much game left to play, it gives you more of an option on a team that you liked. Yeah, but one thing to consider is, remember, the book knows everything you know. Mm -hmm. So if you're betting the Warriors, and say they're minus 10 pregame, at halftime, they're down 16. So you would think, okay, there's half the game left. They should be minus five second half because that was half the game spread. But you also remember they're down, so people expect already expect them to even out. And also maybe, you know, the shot variance hasn't gone where it's going to go. The other team is shooting the lights out and you expect that to come back a little bit. Plus, there's always coaching towards the game results rather than the spread. You know, the coaches aren't coaching to cover. They're coaching to win the game. So while you see, you know, you could come up with a second half five or six, the number you're looking at in that game is going to be closer to, you know, 10 or 11. So make sure you're not giving away too much value when you do that. Because remember, they're looking for the same things you are. That's a very great point. Now, another strategy, and we touched on it a tiny bit here, is hedging. One of the ways that you can set up a hedge is, as you said, if you have a nice long shot futures ticket, then that team gets hot, goes on a run, and all of a sudden you can bet against them on the other stronger teams. What, At what point is it that you start considering a hedge if you're a, an average $100 play better? Is it a point where you get to a dollar amount? Is it get where you get to an amount where you can lock in a certain amount of profit or just when you feel comfortable with the opportunity? Yeah, that's going to be different for everyone, but I would definitely advise to have a strategy before you place a bet. Figure out what's my goal with this bet. Am I going to hedge? When do I start looking to hedge? What price do I want to get out at? How much am I trying to make here? Because you know you have to have all these things ready and you may need to make quick decisions. So I would say definitely be prepared to hedge but don't get locked into anything. And Aaron, the last thing that I want to ask you here, 
we see it with all of the free picks, all of the promotions and people that throw numbers and teams around on social media these days. How is it that you can go about as a new better finding people that you can trust? How do you identify good information from bad? Well, to quote one of the great philosophers of my youth, trust no one. I mean, if somebody is trying to sell picks, they have an ulterior motive. Do they think their picks are good? Probably. Are they good enough to win? If they have to sell them, probably not. You know, there's not a lot of people out there who are really good enough to beat the system. And if they are, they're betting it themselves. And so much of what professional bettors do involves getting the best number, getting the right type of bet, and just saying, I like the Celtics, the Celtics are good, the Celtics are going to beat the hell out of the Kings. There's more to it than that what Sharps do. So find a couple sources that you know and trust who are educated and well-respected within the industry, but be very judicious to who you trust. You know, you talk about paying for picks. I have never paid for picks. I would never pay for picks. I have paid for tools. You know, I'm a subscriber to sites like Ken Palm where I use their data to make more informed bets. There are some people who do very good analysis in the premium space. But if you're paying for here are your locks of the night, that's generally not a good way to go. And that's why people should head on over to us at Betting Pros, where we do give out a bunch of that analysis you talk about. We have insights from experts around the sports betting space. Have to get that plug in there. Guys, please go check it out at bettingpros.com. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me here today. I really appreciate all of the insight. Uh, where can people find you in the awesome work you're doing? I'm over on Twitter at Aaron Kessler, just simply my name. Been there for quite a while. And if you like dumb tweets about sports, I'm your guy. There we go. Aaron, thank you so much once again for your time. Guys, that is going to do it for us here. Don't forget to head on over to bettingpros.com. And in the meantime, we will catch you guys next week. Best of luck with all of your picks and plays for the weekend. Have a good one.